I mean, no one was expecting anything to happen particularly. I rang to talk to Fang Suming, that's, that's Li Nishong's wife, because it had been said that she had visited Li Nishong and the rumors of Li Nishong was, was uh, being tortured. But she wasn't there, and I talked to the younger of the two twin girls, and I said, oh, I hope to come by and see you guys tonight. I was saying goodbye, and she said, oh, my, my, older, sister, my older twin sister wants to talk to you. So we chatted for a while, and uh, then I did my interviews and um, came back, and the house was completely surround, surrounded by police and by reporters. And I asked people, what's happened? What's happened? And no one would tell me. Finally, uh, someone said that, um, that Fang Suming was in the hospital. So I found out which hospital and went, and that's where I learned what had happened. So I didn't even know, because they were, they were, the grandma and the children were murdered around noon. I didn't even know until after six o'clock at night. So it was quite a shock. I told the police at the hospital, you know, I'd talk to the twins around noon and I'd be happy to help them, you know, set up a timeline. And uh, they never got back to me about it. So I found that a bit strange. The next morning, the Lien Ho Bao came. They said, possibly there's a foreigner involved. So uh, then the next day, they said that the foreigner uh, who might be involved may have a Columbia PhD, you know, bearded foreigner and in Taiwan. And not a lot of foreigners had beards and not a lot of foreigners had Columbia PhDs. So I sort of seemed to think it was sort of pointing to me so I rang a couple of young senior people in the um, Guomindang, and both of them suggested that I contact the detective bureau. And so they put me under what was protection, which I had to sort of renew every 24 hours. And then a couple of days later, they then took me to the safe house, and that's where things got a bit more serious. There were a whole bunch of security agencies in Taiwan at the time. And uh, what the police did was set up something called Zhuanan Xiaozu, sort of a special task force to solve the Li Nishong murders, family murders. And um, they, they were the ones that had taken me to the safe house and interviewed me. Yeah, and I was exhausted. I was absolutely exhausted because I hadn't slept really since the murders. When I came out of the 24 hours, the American Institute and Taiwan people were there. I would then be under protection, but it was a different group of police. I was under the Foreign Affairs Police, and uh, they were much nicer. They said, where would you like to go? You know, you're under protection. And I said, well, I've never stayed at the Yuan San Hotel before and then stayed there. So they organized it. And by, by the time I was finished, I had um, eaten everything in every restaurant and every sort of possible dish. <laughs> Uh, I was rather bored with it by the end, but uh, I didn't know what was going on. And there was a lot of contradictions in what the government and the prosecutors were doing. So was I a defendant? Well, I got a, I got a subpoena that said I was a defendant. But if I was a defendant, then it was sort of some things didn't fit together. So it didn't really all fit together in a logical way. My name was in the newspapers virtually every day, you know, to sort of say, oh, there's foreigners involved in this. It wasn't domestic, so to speak. Uh, of course, that began to wear out. The, pre the prosecutor um, gave me a subpoena, and it said it was a, for criminal subpoena, and uh, it said I was a defendant, used the term for defendant, Beigal, and um, it said the reason was murder, Sharon. Uh, so, so in a sense, for them, this was escalating things. And so my response was, let's hold a press conference. 125 reporters came to the, uh, came to the press conference. And my lawyer said to me, just be very calm be, and you know, explain to them that um, you're going to see the prosecutor and I don't, you don't know that you'll come back or not, you'd be able to see them. And uh, if you, you see, and he told me to state clearly, you know, I had nothing to do with this case. And if later on I said something different, you could figure it out for yourself. 
Uh, but it was, it was oblique, but it was clear cut what I was saying because the, the Gaoshung trials were on at the same time. And um, it was very clear that there had been the forced confessions. So that was, there were lots of different things going on and I was making, uh, still asking to leave. Uh, but Chuck Cross, who was head of AIT at the time, said, we've got this big meeting with, um, uh, it was a Taiwan or an ROC American economic meeting and it was going to be held at the Grand Hotel. And Chuck, two months before, said to me, I think that'll be key and you'll either be in jail for that uh, for that meeting or you'll be gone. And so I received another subpoena a couple of days before that meeting was going to take place. They said they were these two witnesses that had seen me go into the Ling's house at noon. And uh, one of them was apparently afraid to talk to me. And the other was a Hakka woman. And she said, she, she testified and I could understand. She said quite clearly that she had seen me go. And so then the prosecutor gave me this chance to cross examine her. I thought a second and I sort of said, you, I said to her, how many foreigners with beards have you seen? And she said, I've just seen one. And so I sort of said, um, if you've just seen one, how do you know it was me? She said, because I've just seen one, I know it was you. And uh, so I could feel the prosecutor's case completely disappear because if I was going to be, if I was going to be um, tried in Taiwan, it would have to be an open trial. So he basically said, you can go, go tonight, book your fare and book. There were a few complications like the government actually insisted that I get a local ROC citizen who would act as a guarantor that I would come back. But in fact, there was that was a bit contradictory too, because as soon as I left, I was put on the visa blacklist, even though I didn't know it. So there are all sorts of contradictions going on. I did fly out that night. My luggage had been completely turned over. They checked everything out. Uh, uh, so, and then I just sat down and cried leaving Taiwan and, you know, after 10 weeks of all this. So, yeah, that's pretty much the story. Mm -hmm.